Hello, Helen. Hello, how are you? I'm good, thank you. First things first, the most important question of the whole interview, how are you doing? How's, how's life <laughs> at the moment? Yeah, it's okay. I think uh, all things considered with everything that's going on in the world, I can't have too many complaints. Obviously, homeschooling and not being able to go out and train and, and play with Watford at the moment is a bit tricky, but you know, at the end of the day, my, my family and, and my close friends are safe and well, so... Yeah, we've just got to try and get through it, but I'm doing okay, thank you. Good. So, obviously, just leading on from what you say, how how would you say, obviously, we're in it right now in Wales? I don't know what it's like in England, because, really, you know, the news just keeps changing at the moment, but how, how have you dealt with lockdown at the moment? Yeah, it has been tough. I think it's pretty similar across, you know, much of the UK right now um, in terms of the rules and regulations can't really go anywhere or do anything other than a little bit of exercise outside and, and obviously essential food shopping. So I think it's quite similar everywhere. Um, for me with the two kids, uh, as I mentioned, I've got a bit of homeschooling to do um, and then try and fit in some individual training of my own, whether that's, you know, we, we bought a treadmill the first time we locked down, which has been a lifesaver for, for me and my husband. Um, so I use that sort of three or four times a week and then try and get outside to do some training as well when I can but yeah it's just taking it day by day I think everybody's in the same sorts of positions you know some people have it a lot harder but we're all trying to get through the same storm as as they say and um, just doing it in our own way and at the minute it's just going day by day and, and taking everything as it comes not trying to look too far ahead or, or get too caught up in it all. We, we've seen teams upload on social media their own sort of um, workouts you just said about your treadmill that you bought that started lockdown. Um, have Watford or Wales actually sent you a strict programme to follow? And if so, has it actually helped? Um, so Watford have. They, it's not necessarily a strict programme because obviously everybody's got different equipment and different access to certain things, um, you know, at home or, you know, places to go and, and train outdoors. So it's we've got a programme that is designed to fit around our own personal circumstances some of the girls still working full-time some of them have been furloughed um some people live in flats where you've not got much you know outdoor space or, or space in you know your house for equipment and stuff like that so yeah our, our, our snc coach has been great in in saying like these are your these are your options basically try and do as best you can to get as much done as, as possible but he understands that it's it's a tough period and it's more just trying to keep us ticking over and, and you know in a position that when we do eventually get back on the training pitch that that we've got a platform to build on and then we can do that together as a team and, and hopefully we'll end up in a in the same place. So throwing it back a few years, how did you actually get into football when you were younger? Yeah, so my older brother, he's about three years older than me. He always played football um, and I spent my weekends and evenings following him around watching his games and kicking the ball around at the side of the pitch as a young kid and playing with him in the garden you know I was, I was normally a target for him to try and practice hitting um, and then he he went off to secondary school and said that I've seen a, an advert for the local football team girls football team why don't you give it a go you obviously like football you're not too bad and for my brother to say that I wasn't too bad was quite a compliment um, so yeah I went along and I think I was about eight or nine and that was it. First session, really enjoyed it. And I think the the weekend after my first session, I played my first game and scored a hat trick. So I guess that sort of kicked off my my love of football. <laughs> There's no better way to do it. And the main question with that, are you better than your brother at football? I'd love to say yes. And although he didn't actually have any sort of career in football, um, he was actually a very good player, but he was quite small. And this was back when players like Lionel Messi weren't a thing. And if you're too small, you were never going to be good enough. And he kept getting told he was too small and he sort of gave up and lost the love for it. But he he's definitely probably like the biggest influence in my career from, from an early age. Um, so I'll give him that one. I'll say that he is better than me. And who were your footballing idols when you were growing up? When, when you were growing up, who, you know, what players were you trying to be like or just who did you like watching the most? Um, so my brother was a Tottenham fan. Um, so I liked players like Teddy Sheringham. I liked all the forwards, but my biggest one was Michael Owen. Um, he just, he sort of epitomised the way I wanted to play off the shoulder of the last defender, quick, in behind, like scoring goals within the 18-yard box. Um, and that's kind of how I saw myself as a player um, and sort of 
almost tried to model my game on him and he, he's still one of the best finishers I've ever seen in in football and you know people like yourselves a bit younger than me probably thinking oh, I only remember or, or not even remember the, the last years of his career when he was blighted by injuries and perhaps didn't show what he was about but when he burst onto the scene he was incredible and you know one of one of the players I enjoyed watching the most and could win a game on his own. So, yeah, he's probably the, the biggest one. There weren't really any women's footballers that I knew of because there was no coverage of it, no you know, no women's games on the TV. And I just played because I love football, not because I saw any sort of pathway into senior football. Um, so, unfortunately, I didn't have any, any female role models within football um, growing up. But obviously, that's, that's changed now for the younger generation, which is fantastic. That actually perfectly brings me on to my next question. You just highlighted perfectly how there are actually idols for younger women to look up to in football. So over the last five to 10 years, have you noticed a gradual process of the game changing and growing? Yeah, hundred um, percent. From, like I said, from when I was an eight or nine year old, not really knowing anything about women's football, whether there are even any teams of, of, you know, women's teams going up to, to senior level, um, now you see kids walking around with with players' names on their backs, on their shirts, and you know they're not going after the the big names in the Premier League. They want the names of their their heroes that they go and watch at the weekend, you know, in the WSL or you know internationally as well. So it's it's brilliant. And you know, as an international team with Wales, when we get to meet the kids that come and watch training sessions, or we go and visit schools, and then talking about all the players that they like, and you know, to hear female names coming out of their mouths is amazing. Um, so for them to have something visual, it's why this pandemic's been so hard because people haven't been able to come and watch games. Um, you just hope that they don't forget about us um, and will able, when they are able to come back, they, they come back in their numbers. And um, it's a real nice community, women's football. Um, and I think, you know, especially in Wales over the last couple of, couple of years, two, three years, what we did as a national team coming so close to qualifying for the World Cup and you know, being in with the shout of the Euros as well. Um, hopefully that's brought our, our community even closer and we've got a really good, strong support behind us. You just said about the names on the back of the shirts. I saw on the Watford Ladies Instagram that recently you had your shirt in the club window at the stadium next to Ben Foster. How did that make you feel when you saw that in the club shop? Yeah, it's amazing. Um, you know, most people know that Watford is a very special club for me. It's my hometown. It's where I grew up and I've been a season ticket holder since I was a real young girl. Um, so to walk into the club shop and see my name on the back of a shirt next to, you know, obviously last year, Premier League team up there with Premier League players, Troy Deeney, Ben Foster, like you said, um, is it was a really nice touch and a really sort of special moment. And, you know, all all the sort of branding in the background as well had um, some of my teammates modelling the new kits and that kind of thing. And and that, that might seem something really small to a lot of people, but it, it's not always been the norm. And hopefully over the years, that'll just become something that happens and, and you don't really take notice of it. You just, it's part of the, the background, part of the culture of football is that the women's teams and the men's teams are sat alongside each other and promoted in exactly the same way. And I'm fortunate that, with Watford and with Wales, that's very much the case. And hopefully, you know, other clubs and countries will, will follow suit and, and join that sort of, you know, making it a normality. So moving on to Wales now, how did you, like, you know, everyone dreams of playing for their country one day. How did you feel when you made your debut for Wales? Yeah, it was unbelievable. It was a bit strange and I don't know how many people know that I actually... I'm going to whisper this, <laughs> played for England under 23s um, a couple of times. But as soon as I got the opportunity, as soon as the, the coaching staff found out that I could play for Wales, I went along to a training session. And from the minute I stepped in, I knew it was where I was meant to be. As cliche as that sound and as, as cringy as that sounds, I just felt at home there. The, the girls were brilliant. The staff were brilliant. And I think I had to wait a couple of months before the next game. Um, but to to then step on the pitch and, and make my debut alongside the likes of Jane Ludlow who you know had won everything in football and be part of you know she was the captain of this team and I'm thinking wow this is this is it this is why I play football um, and then from then on it was just it's just been an amazing I think 12 years nearly 13 years since that that day um, and yeah I look back with it with so much pride and 
it meant absolutely everything to me to pull that shirt on and, and make my debut. Brilliant. Yeah, I think, that, I think that decision to <laughs> play for Wales worked out pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, not just you either. <laughs> um, how did you feel when you actually scored your first goal for Wales, though? Was it more of, was it a sense of pride? Was it more than just getting the call up? Funnily enough, it was in that same game <clears throat> and we were playing away to Luxembourg. We actually went 1-0 down, which wasn't part of the plan. They weren't, we weren't supposed to be getting beaten by Luxembourg. Um, but I managed to equalise quite soon after. So I think the actual initial feeling was relief more than anything. Um, and then, you know, the girl celebrated and Jane grabbed me by the sort of by the head and said, we've got a goal scorer. And that was it. I thought, right, I'm OK. The captain likes me. This superstar says I'm I'm OK, I'm good, I'm going to score goals. And, and that was it from, from the minute then. I, the sort of weight was lifted because as a forward, you're always searching for that first goal, whether it's at a new club or making your debut for your country. You, you're judged on goals. So to get one quite early in my first game, was it was more of a, a relief um, than anything. And then, yeah, I think it just went from there. I think if I hadn't scored that goal that day, it could have been a different story in the, in the years to follow. Well, that's the thing. To anyone who doesn't know, no, no, Helen is the all-time leading goal scorer for Wales, not just in the women. Like You've got more goals than Gareth Bale for Wales. So <laughs> like, does that really sink in ever, like knowing that you've, you've scored the most goals for your country? I don't think it, I don't think it can sink in. It, it's a really strange um, feeling, to be honest. And somebody asked me recently what it felt like to break the record. And I honestly couldn't tell you when I broke the record. I wasn't aware of what the record was who had it either for women's football, men's football, Welsh football. Um, so I don't actually know the moment that it happened. I couldn't tell you when it was, which is a shame really, because I don't know, maybe I could have planned some sort of celebration. I don't know. Um, I think I was aware of uh, Jane being the top goal scorer. But again, I don't know when I sort of surpassed that. Um, but yeah, I think it's something that once I stop playing, maybe we sink in a little bit more and, I'll look back and think, actually, that's pretty cool. Um, pretty cool to have done it. But, yeah, it's kind of just happened without me realising, which is a bit strange. Obviously, scoring goals for us is one thing, but becoming the captain, that's, that's on another level. Do, do, you, do you feel an added pressure in terms of for younger, look, for people looking up and for your teammates, do you feel there's a pressure within it? Um, so obviously, yeah, I'm a captain of Watford. I'm not not the captain of Wales, but the being captain of Watford, I think, yeah, the, the younger players do tend to look up to you. Um, I think perhaps that that would happen anyway with the experience I've got. We've got quite a young squad, um, but I think you are the sort of go-to person maybe when you've got the armband of if you've got something you need to to discuss with with the management, but you're not quite sure how to approach it. You maybe go to the captain first, or if you want any advice. It's, it's always quite a handy sort of port of call if you like um, and I think some players they take it they take it on their shoulders and, and it maybe weighs a bit heavy they maybe put too much pressure on themselves but really I think a, a good captain and you know someone like Sophie she she took that armband at a really young age but she just it was just natural for her she's a natural leader um, and she was able to handle it really really well um, just by being herself. And I think those are the best captains that, that don't necessarily seek out the armband or do anything differently to be the captain. They just they just seem to fit. And, and Sophie certainly fits that bill. Um, and she's been a fantastic captain for us. And, and I'm sure she will be for many years to come. And obviously, you've already brought up the recent qualification campaign that was unfortunately so closely unsuccessful. Obviously, we, we spoke to Lily Woodham recently on here as well, and she talked about it as well. But it does show the progression, doesn't it? And how far the team has come. So like, where, what do you think the next stage is? Obviously qualification, but where do you think that is really going to start coming to, into play? Yeah, so I think in the World Cup campaign, we probably overachieved um, when, when we had that chance against England. It didn't, didn't quite happen. And obviously qualification for a World Cup is really tough anyway, with the, the fewer teams that qualify through Europe. Um, so that that sort of set us a standard that was maybe not unrealistic because I'm still I still think we should have qualified from from our campaign that we've just had, but it, it wasn't to be. But I think we set that bar so high that then 
the next campaign we came into it with an expectation that we hadn't had to deal with before um everyone's looking on looking at the group and thinking this is it this is wales chance this is you know it's now or never and and we'd never been in that position before we've never been expected to achieve anything so i think that was a that was something we had to get our heads around and you know the early early games and the early draws against northern ireland maybe reflected that that pressure um we didn't necessarily feel it at the time but looking back maybe that was it that we'd put so much pressure on ourselves to to qualify from this group and we just didn't have we just didn't have that maybe experience to get through those tougher moments in tough games um but don't get me wrong i still think you know we've only lost to norway twice we've not been defeated by anyone else and we only lost those two games by one goal so those are the sort of markers we can take into the next campaign where we're running teams that regularly compete in world cups and get to the later stages in in european and, and world competitions we've taken them to the wire in two games it wasn't a fluke just doing it the once um, we've done it twice we've drawn with england so we, we're now competing with these top teams regularly and i think that's that's the biggest thing to take from it aside from not qualifying we are we step by step we're getting there and I think like you said qualification is obviously the big goal and the ultimate aim um, but we just have to keep progressing and keep getting closer and tighter to those top nations and you know when when the time comes if we keep doing that then then we will qualify but I think you have to sort of look at it in smaller parts rather than the overall goal because you can get a little bit drowned out by that. So you spoke about Jane Ludlow being a big person in your career and obviously on your debut she was a big help um, and obviously on the on Monday the news broke of Jane Ludlow stepping down from her role as the head coach were you shocked to see that news come out? Yeah um, we're all taken aback by it I think and I think I can speak for the majority if not all of the squad with that um, I think in terms of timing if it was going to happen it would probably be now in you know, in the sense that we finish one campaign and we've got a little bit of time until the next one starts. Um, so if you're going to, if the management change is going to happen, that's when it's going to be. But that that's not to say we're expecting it by any means. Um, what Jane's done in the last six years has been incredible for Welsh women's football. Um, she's put us on the map. Um, I think her profile initially when she came in, having, as I said before, she's won everything you can in club football. So for a, a big name like her to come, come back to her home country and, and manage the national team instantly sort of raised interest, which was fantastic for us. Um, so, yeah, we, we were sort of all looking ahead to this year with, with the assumption that we were going to carry on and, you know, build on what we've been doing with Jane. Um, but, but that's not to be. And, you know, obviously we all wish her, her well in her next endeavours, whatever they may be. Um, but yeah, it was, it was disappointing to, to hear the news on Monday. Um, but, it's the the realities of football now I suppose you you can't ever get too comfortable in a position you know whether that's playing or, or managing um, and women's football is sort of becoming the same not the same as men's but you know there's a higher turnover of of coaches and managers in men's football and although I don't want women's football to go in exactly the same direction the the sort of pressures and the the things surrounding it are, are perhaps catching up and yeah that's just something that's that we're going to have to deal with, I suppose. But um, yeah, obviously, like I said, what Jane's done has been fantastic for us and, and we'll never forget the, the six years that we've had with her as our manager. Do you see any potential future replacement? <laughs> obviously, the Cardiff City manager has just left. Neil Harris is available <laughs> for he's available for the Welsh setup. Do you, who do you see as a potential future replacement for Jane Ludlow? Because obviously it's big shoes to fill. Yeah, huge. Um, I don't know, to be honest. Um, I'm sure that the FAW would be, you know, putting their, their feelers out there and, and getting the job description and the job role out for those who, who may be interested. And I'm sure there's one or two that they might target. But I honestly, I couldn't say. I think it's, like you said, it's a big job to fill. It's very different to club football. Coming into international football, you don't have the same sort of time to affect your players on the training pitch. Um, you get probably six or seven camps a year where you're with your players for a week to 10 days. It's not a lot of time to, to get your ideas across. So it's a different sort of coaching and different sort of style of management. Um, sorry, I can apologise for the noise in the background. It's my dog playing with something. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, I'm I'm sure that they'll they're going to go through a very thorough process and not make any rush decisions. Um, you know, for me and for the girls, we just want the right person for the job. We don't need it to tick boxes for for anything. We just want the right person that's going to come in with with the right mindset to kind of try and, and build on what we've we've already done because I think we're in a good place at the moment. Um, I don't think there's any need to scrap what we're doing and, and start all over. So hopefully it's someone that can come and build on what we've got. Well, it might be Neil Harris, how do we know? But um, <laughs> as a fan looking into the world of professional football, I've always been intrigued to know how the professional players actually find out that the manager has left. So on Monday, when the news actually broke, or oh, you might have known the day before, how did you find out? Yeah, so we we got sent um, sort of an email as a squad just to say, look, this is what's happening. Um, they obviously didn't want us to find out on social media, but at the same time, they weren't going to break the news to us too soon because, you know, as much as it's embargoed, you're going to talk to friends and family and there's every chance that, that things like that can get out as, as we've seen in in football in the past. Um, <laughs> sorry, that's my son this time. Um, so, yeah, we, we just got told sort of as a whole squad, um, obviously they'd rather have done it, I assume, in person or, you know, a bit more uh, together, but we can't we can't do that right now. So, yeah, we, we found out earlier that day um, just to be sort of made aware of, of what was going to be coming out on in the news and in social media over the next few hours. So, yeah, we didn't find out any, you know, really any earlier than anyone else. And I don't think it was a decision that was made sort of massively in advance. I'm sure discussions were being had by various people, but yeah, we, we didn't find out too much before you guys. Um, obviously, during your career, you've had spells at uh, Arsenal, Chelsea, Reading, and obviously Watford, of course. So, what is there a difference in terms of playing for someone like you know, Arsenal and then obviously your hometown team Watford? Like, what is there a big difference in the way that they are? Uh, the first thing is probably the expectation. Obviously, going to a club like Arsenal, we're used to winning things. There's that expectation to win every game, uh, whereas Watford perhaps is more of a. Obviously, you want to win every game and you want to challenge for for the, the competitions that you're in but there's there's not that expectation of of being world class or you know winning the major tournaments or uh, major trophies and major competitions um so that's probably the biggest thing um it's hard it's, it's hard really because when i played for arsenal things were so different and at the time the setup there was incredibly professional in comparison to other places but then right now although i'm in a a club that's sort of a couple of divisions below the setup I'm at with Watford is very similar to what it was at Arsenal before so it's hard for me to compare because they're sort of they're almost different eras even though I'm in the, you know it, it's still me and it's my same career um in those sort of 10-15 years a lot has changed in that the levels everywhere have, have been raised um and the levels of professionalism around women's football have, have gone up so so much. Um, but I'd, I'd imagine that things at Arsenal are very different to what, what they were when I was there. Um, and it's a, it's a very professional setup now. So there, there are differences, but at the same time, I suppose they, they, they've changed with the times as well as... as um, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm waffling now. Um, they've changed with the times as well as sort of with the status of professional or, or semi-professional sides. And obviously, Watford have had sorry, uh, Watford have had uh, problems in the last few years. But where do you think they'll be in the next five years, given the problems they've obviously had in the last few years? Yeah, so the the club went through a bit of a transitional phase. Um, but within, you know, I've been back. I think this is my fourth season now, um, and things have changed dramatically since my first spell and then again since I first signed um, you know my, for my second spell um, and the people behind the scenes you know right to the top of, of the club the, the, the CEO and the director of football and everyone like that is is massively behind us um, which is huge obviously the pandemic hasn't helped because we'd have hoped to have got promoted into the championship last season 
I'm not sure what's going to happen this season. Um, what with it being paused again? Um, but we're ready as a club off the pitch, and I feel we're ready on the pitch as well to step up to the championship. It's just a case of sort of waiting and seeing if if that can happen this year. Um, waiting and sorry, <laughs> waiting and seeing if that can happen this year or or not. Um, but yeah, we can just keep doing what we're doing and and hoping hoping it's enough. Um, but certainly. It, you know, if you're looking at five years, I'd like to say we'll we'll be in the championship before five years is up. I'd be very disappointed if we're not. On your Instagram, which is Helen Wardy Ten, for anyone wondering, by the way, just give <laughs> that social media shout out for you. Thank you. Um, we see you're posting a lot about uh, videos about the Watford crowds, obviously being a season ticket holder over the years. Um, is fans being in the stadium something you're missing? Yeah, um, we always love having our our supporters there. We were lucky that actually a weird sort of ruling meant that because we were non-elite, we were actually allowed crowds during the times we were playing this season. Um, So we did have a good group that came down to the the few league games we've had at home this year, and that's been fantastic. But weirdly then, being non-elite has meant that we now can't play, so it's, it's a bit strange. It's had its... It's had its pluses, um, but it's obviously also got its drawbacks. Um, but yeah, I think you know anyone playing for Wales, we obviously haven't had a crowd in the last few the last few qualifiers, and and I do think, especially that home game against Norway, I think it would have been amazing to have had a really good crowd behind us because it could have made that difference um, in us trying to get a result. And as a female footballer, you, you know, you, in the early days, you're used to playing in front of you know your mum your mum and your dad and a couple of other people with their dogs or whatever you don't you didn't get too too big a crowd but in the last few years that's certainly changed and certainly for international football we've we've had an incredible support behind us so once you get something you get used to it and to have it taken away has has been difficult so we're we're as desperate to have the the fans back in the stadium as much as um as much as the guys you know that come along to watch are so yeah we can't wait to have them back um, obviously, retirement is something you've spoken about a lot um, in the past year. So what is your plan after retirement? Because we've seen you doing a lot of media work for Sky Sports News. Every time I turn the TV on, I see you on Sky Sports News <laughs> at the moment. And with your first class honours in sports writing and broadcasting, is that an area you'd like to explore? Or would you like to go into more coaching in football and then building up teams? Yeah, I think, um, obviously, yeah, I've had conversations about retirement just because my age it sort of happens naturally and you get asked the question um the pandemic I think has delayed my retirement um I have considered it because it's been really it has been really tough at times but I'm I'm determined to not let Covid beat beat me and when I look back on my career I don't want to think it ended because of coronavirus so I think I'm going to try and put that to the back of my mind for a little while but but when the time does come yeah certainly media and broadcasting is something that I'm interested in and you know as you said you, I'm trying to get experience and get my face out there as much as possible Um don't always have my kids and dog in the background making noise and interrupting those those media opportunities um, but uh, <laughs> yeah I think um, that's certainly an avenue I'd want to go down I haven't ruled out coaching um, it's not something I've paid too much of my time to at the moment um, just because of focusing on other things really but it's not something I'd rule out and you know people have said to me before that it, it might be something that that could interest me and, and I'd certainly have a have a look into it but yeah I've not made any sort of concrete plans um, I'm just sort of going with the flow and taking opportunities when I can and and trying to get as much experience in, in different areas as I can. And just for this final segment, obviously the men's team are going to be going into the Euros this summer. Huge campaign ahead of them. Uh, just obviously, their last campaign in the Euros obviously went pretty well, getting to the semi-finals. How far do you reckon this team can go, though? Yeah, it's tough, isn't it? Um, I, I mean, I don't know if this, the setup of the competition will have an impact, if it is going to be across Europe rather than just in one country. I don't know if that makes any difference, because I do know that in 2016 they had their home base and they really made the most of that um, and I think it was a big part of their success is having that that, that home sort of base in Bernard I think it was 
um, in France. And I think that not having that may make a difference when you're constantly moving around. It's difficult to, you know, sleep in different hotels and that kind of stuff. Um, but in terms of the squad, it's a very different squad. It's very young this time round. Um, obviously, Gareth Bale's had his had his injury um, problems in in recent years and lack of game time at Real Madrid. Aaron Ramsey the same. He's had from some injury issues. So you just hope that when the tournament comes round, that they're going to be fit and ready to go. Because if they're if they're firing and playing well for Wales, then then Wales as a team plays well. Um, and is a, it makes a massive difference, and the younger players thrive off that. Um, but I am I'm excited. I think David Brooks, Daniel James, all these players, they really raise their game when they play for Wales. Harry Wilson, the youngsters in the middle, Ethan Ampadu, um, Joe Rodon, they've come on so much in recent years um, that I'm excited to see what they can do on the biggest stage. Um, you, you kind of write them off thinking, no, there's not enough experience, they haven't got... You know, if Joe Allen's not been playing or, or Gareth or uh, Rambo's been injured, you kind of write them off, but then they pop up and, and win the game 1-0 when you're not expecting it. So it's it's going to be different, I think. Um, but maybe maybe good that they go into it with, you know, not the expectation of 2016. Because, um, again, like I said earlier in the podcast, I think the pre- when you go into things with that pressure, it, it can make life a bit more difficult. But maybe they won't have that. I think there'll be an expectation from within and I think those that know the team but from the outside maybe they won't be expected to do quite as well as they did last time and, and that might help them. So you've just you basically just answered the next question. Um, you, obviously Gareth Bale he's had a lot of talk around him recently and there's been debate if he's passed his best and if Tottenham was the right move for him and if it was an anticlimactic transfer in a way. Um, which players do you think will be pivotal to a potential successful tournament? Um, I think obviously Gareth will still be a, a massive part of that um, as long as he's fit which hopefully he will be um, and uh, yeah those ones I mentioned Joe Allen, Aaron Ramsey they're sort of the core of the team but I think in terms of the younger players coming through um, I really like Ethan Ampadu. He hasn't had the, the best time at Sheffield United this season, but in the last few games that I've seen, I think he's he's stepped up again and he's doing what we've all seen him do for a few years in a Welsh shirt. And again, that, like I said before, so many of these players, they may not be having the best time at their clubs, but something about putting that, that dragon on your chest, it just raises your, your performance. They they all play for each other. They're, they're a really close-knit group and I think that has such a big impact on their performance. You know, Dan James, he doesn't get a look in at United, yet he, he turns up to Wales and, and he's electric most of the time. And I think, for me, the the sort of the spine of the team, Ben Davis, again, doesn't always play for Spurs, but he he's a rock. And if he's playing, I think if Joe Rodon's playing, I think if Ethan Ampadu's playing, David Brooks, if he's fit, they've got so many players that have the ability to control and change a game. Um, that they're in a really good position that that many from the outside looking in may not see may not see that as the case because they look at their club form. Um, but yeah, there's too many to mention really as to who could be really important. But it's just the case of, of keeping as many of them fit and ready to play as possible. So we're just going to play a little game in a way. This is um, which player would you rather start at the Euros? So okay. I'll start. Harry Wilson or David Brooks? Obviously, they're two phenomenal players at the moment. Who would you rather have in the starting eleven, or would you have both? I think I'd go David Brooks, just because he has that. I think Harry Wilson's obviously fantastic, and his ability from a set piece as well could be really important in and around the box or from you know corners as well. But I think David Brooks has got that that natural ability to go past the player. He glides with the ball. Um, and he's had that ever since he made his debut as a as a young kid a few years ago. He, as soon as he stepped on the pitch, he thought he's a bit different. And he's he's almost I don't I don't want to say it, but he's almost like a, a Ryan Giggs with the ball. The way he just he looks so effortless as he he runs with the ball the same as he does without it. Um, and I think that's a an ability that not many players are fortunate to have. Um, so yeah, for me, I'd go David Brooks. Uh, this one's quite relevant at the moment, I'd say. Uh, Connor Roberts or Nico Williams? 
Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, probably for experience, both in international and club football, at the minute I'd, I'd edge for Connor Roberts. But what a replacement to have, what an alternative option to have in Nico Williams. You know, he's won the Premier League with Liverpool and okay, it might have only been a small part, but he's been part of a, of a Premier League winning team. He's been in and around a, a squad of players that have, have won the the Champions League, the World Cup, Club Cup, obviously the Premier League. And, you know, he's, he's, he's playing second field to, to a f- fantastic player in Trent Alexander-Arnold. So he's learning all the time. And although he's not playing every game, he's still training with some of the best players in the world. So he's, he's going to be in a good position. Um, and he has done really well when he has played for Wales. Again, he stepped on the pitch and he's, he's upped his game. So I think if either of them played, it wouldn't be a bad thing. But if, if I was picking a team and they were playing tomorrow, I'd probably just go for Connor Roberts just because of yeah, that experience and, and the amount of games he's playing for Swansea and playing very well for Swansea at the moment as well. So on to the centre-backs, Joe Roden or Chris Methan? Yeah, um, probably Joe Rodon. I'm probably going against what I've just said just now about <laughs> experience. Um, but what I've seen of him, he's been... He's been fantastic and I think, again, the move to Spurs is a great one um, and he'll be learning from some excellent players, the likes of Alder Verold and, you know, training and playing with Hugo Lloris behind him as well. He'll be learning an awful lot. Hopefully he can grow into it and he, he had a fan, he's had a fantastic couple of games when he has had his chance. Um, and he, he's very elegant. He looks great and he's played a lot of games for Swansea um, at quite a young age as well. So, although he hasn't got necessarily the experience of Chris Meppham, um, I think he's probably caught him up in terms of how he's playing and, and the, the ability he's got, you know, with and without the ball. Well, that's the thing. Rodon's even had the armband for a while against Finland re- briefly. But um, the final one, how Robson Carnu or Kiefer Moore? Oh, very different options. Um, mm. Oh, it's really tough that one I, I love how and I think yeah I think how I can't help but think of that goal <laughs> against Belgium it was unbelievable um, my only worry is that he has had a period out of the side and out of the, the squad um, maybe not had as much game time in and around this this environment as as Kiefer Moore and Kiefer Moore has come in and, and done brilliantly and he's offered a different point of attack because of the attributes he's got, he's strong and he brings others into play and, and he gets in and around the box and finishes, you know, those chances, with, whether it's with his head or getting on the end of a low cross. He's there or thereabouts and, and he's taken all of his goals very well. Um, I, I, I don't know. I guess it depends on the opposition and the type of team you're playing, but I'm going to have to make a decision, aren't I? So I'm going to go key for more. Um, but it was hard. That was hard. <laughs> Well, he's on form for the Bluebirds at the moment. But um, those are all the questions we got on today's podcast. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us. We've, we've loved this time with you. And we hope to have you back at a future date, if you would thank accept. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Hopefully it'll be a bit of a quieter environment next time. I did ask the kids to stay upstairs, but they obviously got bored. So <laughs> apologies for the noise in the background, but hopefully it wasn't too disturbing. But yeah, um, thank you for time. Go on, Ben Joe. But yeah, thank you for the time. That's all we've got. Thank you, Helen. And we'll stop the recording there. Thank you very much. Also, the social medias for Helen are going to be on the screen now, if the editing all goes right. So go and check <laughs> Helen out. Go give her a follow. And I hope you enjoyed the interview with Helen Ward. Thank you. Thank you.